We are live on YouTube. Trying to figure the rest of StreamYard out. It's not perfect. Let's do a sound check real quick, Marty. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, now you're loud and clear. You're good. All right. So welcome to the stream. Broadcasting from all over the United States. <laughs> Right here in Hollywood, Florida. Rockwall, Texas. We are live on the yard, and now I need to find your notes. I've got them right here. Let me just email them to you. Trying to remember if we just... Coming your way. Looks like I have done several of them, and I am. Um, it's probably better if you just send them again. Thank you. Got it. Well, we're still a minute early, so so there's an outtake here that YouTube can. And YouTube viewers, you can watch this outtake. Relish in its plebeianness, amateurness, amateur eshness. Right, your video's frozen for me. I don't know if it's frozen for you, but it's frozen for me. Dang it. No, I'm good. I have connection is unstable if you're off Wi Fi. I am plugged in. I am not on Wi Fi. Let me. Let me get on Wi-Fi. I don't know why. Well, let's see. How about that? For me, it still looks like you're frozen. Mm. I can hear you fine. Turn your camera off, turn it back on. <laughs> Just like the computer reboot. <laughs> yeah i'm not really sure uh you know maybe i jump out we're having some technical difficulties so uh bear with us here How's hey here you are now you're live and in motion so that's very odd. And it is 3.16 p.m. So we're on time, and we've got three minutes of garbage outtakes. And let's, uh, let's roll. Let's roll. Let's get... So let's, let's just start with introductions. Okay. Marty, please identify yourself for the record. <laughs> <laughs> you litigation guys, always doing that stuff. Good, good. good. Hey, I'm uh, Marty Elbert. I am uh, the owner and sole attorney here, sole, sole, uh, not sole proprietor. That's a bad thing. Uh, sole attorney at Circle of Life Legal Services here in Florida. We only practice law in Florida. I do have a license in Iowa, but it's on hold for now because um, I didn't want to do the double CLEs to keep it going. Uh, but that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. Uh, it's not that difficult. I just didn't, didn't get around to doing it. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, there's a there's a cost benefit of... It's, it's not even... not It's, it's negligible for Iowa. So uh, it's just one of those things I was like, eh, I'll just hang on. Um, yeah. So anyway... I am here. I practice in uh, estate planning and probate and a little bit of business services when it has to do with my clients needing to put together a proper um, operating agreement or a business structure for their business so we can properly plan for it. So it really all has to do with uh, estate planning. That's, that's awesome. Me. That's excellent. Yeah. 
I no longer do litigation. Um, I, well, I shouldn't say none, but I have, I have two probate litigation cases. Most of my probates are administration, um, but I did take on a couple nice uh, probate litigation cases that's not that aren't going to be too too uh, too time consuming. So right, too too got contentious. Just just didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, took my last family law case uh, a little over two years ago. And look at the smile on my face. There's a lot of compassion control in, in family law litigation. You know, it's, it's, you know, and then that I think is a subject for another, yes, it for, is. for another yeah. litigation case. But right now what we're, you know, what we're focusing on is going to talk about criminal law today. Right. We're going to talk about criminal law. So let's just dive right in because we, all right. We gave well, ourselves a short give, clock. Give us your little uh, short intro, who you are and what you're doing. Well, my name's Casey oh, you're Ashmore. Right. Okay. Yeah. My name's Casey Ashmore. I'm a, I'm still a litigator. I had the privilege of meeting Marty at a 10 X conference and we, we've been friends ever since and actually have, you know, run into each other at other professional development conferences and engaged in, you know, this dialogue that's coming to fruit, you know, coming to bear fruit today, which is we're going to start working on each other's, platforms so that we can spread a bigger message, a, a, a bigger reach. And today we're just going to focus on criminal defense. So I have a, I'm very lucky to still be litigating, still very passionate about it. And we do have a litigation firm, which means, you know, trial court advocacy firm. And a big part of what we do is criminal defense, especially representing the poorest clients, the indigent clients, the clients, you know, we've all grown up hearing that phrase. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. And from time to time, I have had the privilege of being that attorney. And, and how did, why did you decide to practice in criminal law? How did you get into it? Well, it's something I always wanted to do. And it took some lessons through the course of some other mentors. One of them was John Grisham. We've all read his books mm -hmm. where he said, I believe it was in the firm or the Pelican brief for a time to kill, go learn <clears throat> your craft, spend 10 years with a senior attorney, learn your craft, and then go out and save the world one case at a time. Right. And I took that probably a little too much to heart. I, I did just about the 10 year John Grisham plan, but I knew I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to help others because you're talking about helping people at their most vulnerable, at their lowest point, when they have the overwhelming weight of the United States government or the government of the state in which you live in the county attorney's office, the district attorney's office. Those are agencies with literally unlimited resources, even if you're not Al Qaeda, unlimited resources. And I had the privilege of working at the Texas court of criminal appeals for my first boss, Barbara Hervey. Thank you judge for giving me an at bat. I'll never forget her. We're still good friends to this day, but I, learned a lot of things about criminal law working for judge Hervey. The most important of which was you must always be on the lookout for Gideon and not to bore with a great bunch of details, but Gideon versus Wainwright is a very famous case was a Henry Fonda movie. And it literally changed the world as far as the United States goes, because prior to that case in the late fifties or early sixties, Unless it was a federal crime, poor citizens were not entitled to an attorney in state cases. 
and I think the film's called Gideon's Gideon's Light, Gideon's Candle. Doesn't really matter, but it's a it's a case about a one of our poorest citizens who was wrongly locked up for many years, and once he was afforded a new attorney because of the protections of the Constitution of the United States, which reach our state courts through the 14th Amendment, ironically a slavery amendment, but that's how the protections of the first 10 amendments actually touch each individual man, woman, and child in this country. And that's the big push is looking for, for clients with those possibilities, their needs, and especially the, who have the, the, the narrowest of resources. Yeah. So, so you're very passionate about it. I can see that. And that, that's really what it takes. But have, have you heard this before? Like, how can you defend people that break the law and are clearly guilty? How can you do that? How can you get up there and argue for them? Th that is very difficult because I get that statement. I, I truly get it. And in those situations, you're, you're doing a couple of things. You know, one, you have to protect client privileges because even though you, you're their attorney they rarely want to they rarely want to connect with you and especially initially right there's mistrust they've had prior court appointed attorneys nobody ever did them right the system messed them over etc cetera, etc cetera. think every movie you've ever seen about about criminals especially shawshank redemption right everybody inside is innocent yep there's always a way to duck personal responsibility, but you know, how do you represent somebody who's truly guilty, clearly guilty is you make sure that, that the government did such a good job, whether that's the state of Texas or the United States of America, that the government did such a good job. There's no way it's coming back on appeal. Right. Right. Yep. That's how you do that. And your, that's your job is, right. Yeah, it's often this damage control, but also making sure that, you know, every every rock was flipped over so right. that and I, just, justice is not miscarried. Sorry, Marty. Oh, yeah, that's right. You give them the best defense possible. You protect their rights. You're not necessarily looking at them as, oh, this is a great person or they're wrong. It's, you're protecting their rights, which is protecting the Constitution which is protecting our system. And when you do such a good job defending that person and they get put away, they're not coming back on appeal, just like what you said. You know, and, and my law professor said that many, many years ago. And when I was doing criminal law, that's really what I thought of. And I said, I'm, I'm, doing, the, I'm doing the community a service because if this person gets put away, they're getting put away. And I'm going yeah, to- it'll be it'll be for if they get out early it's because of leniency clemency a pardon it's not it's not going to be some sort of a, an error that requires that their conviction be overturned right and that's that's truly and it's a daunting challenge. I, I, I know you don't practice criminal defense anymore, but I know you did for many years. And that's a hard thing to do because you, you do have to make sure that all their constitutional and you're not defending them for the sake of them. You're defending them for every other innocent citizen. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So, Hey, what's the most interesting case you've ever taken to trial? The most interesting criminal case I have ever taken to trial was a young, young African American man, East Texas, all white jury, never seen more cops or people who worked for a church or retired cops on a jury pool ever. Mm. And the only people of color in in our courthouse were a few people who work for the county and the 
the defendant and his family. And sometimes that's just the nature of things in, in East Texas. You know, you get a jury pool that, that is very disproportionate, even if there are jury summons sent out to the entirety of the county, all the registered voters that, you know, some of them come, don't come. COVID was going on, but the case was interesting for several reasons, the chief of which was this was going to be the first of five life sentences this young man faced. Mm. Wow. And I think the reason why we had to take it to trial was because we could not come to any sort of meeting of the minds with regards to a reasonable way to resolve every single one of these cases, which were none of which were particularly bad, but this was a young man who'd had a troubled frequent, you know, recidivism, right? I mean, the guy was, he, he had a lot of things going against him. His mother was incarcerated when he was a little boy. So from nine to 18, raised by a grandparent, had a real hard time controlling him. He was extremely angry at his mother and his father who lived in a different county and wasn't close to either of them. And I just felt like he had a lot of bad experiences. You know, he had had, he had invested in legal services by being in trouble a lot, not by having the money to do it, but, yeah. but he had never had anybody fight for him. He never had an attorney willing to go to trial for him. And he wasn't going to take a life sentence. He wasn't going to take a 40 year offer on any one of those right. cases. And, you know, when you're in your thirties and you're looking at 40 years, even if you only have to do half to be parole eligible, you're still going to be in your late fifties. You know, that's not much of a life left to somebody yeah who's not thinking about how great life and short and precious it is to, you know, now that I'm, when I was in my 30s, I was 50, so dang old, but now I'm, <laughs> I'm on the other end of that. <laughs> so I think that's one of the reasons the why, but what was interesting about it was these little battles. And I tell people a lot that what we do is similar to boxing, very similar to boxing. You want to, I know Marty's heard this before too, but, you want to and probably would agree, but you, you want to be landing more punches than you take ahead in the points, standing when the bell rings and hopefully win by decision. And these little battles over the constitution that came up through the course of the trial, the most critical of which had to do with, the search and seizure of my client's person that, you know, came off miraculously. I'll just say that, that, that this young man had a jacket with more pockets than a clown car. There must have been 11 to 22 different pockets in this jacket. And the officer who did the side of the road stop was extremely thorough in emptying the jacket and being very courteous to my client. And my client was very courteous to the law yeah. enforcement officer. They knew each other. It's a small town. They went to high school together. There were some laughs, some old times. And then, you know, my client is transported from one detention facility to another as he works his way to the county jail. More, more Terry frisks, more pat downs, more searches of this clown car jacket. I mean, things just coming out in every direction. Da, 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 da. So eventually, and maybe this is the CSI phenomenon, eventually some contraband is found in the jacket but it's not on film. The officer who the, was the testifying witness, the, the main investigating officer in the case did not find it. And the state could not get the contraband into trial. 
So at that point, the jury had heard and seen 40 minutes of police questioning, interrogation, talking about other bad acts, other prior offenses, that, things that had nothing to do with this alleged contraband, which was not, you know, so two things happened. Jury is thinking that's not fair to make us watch 40 minutes of something that this man is not on trial for mm -hmm. and, and did years ago. Yeah, right. And second, where the heck is the video of the actual contraband being found? That flipped that case. And the next thing, we had an agreement to resolve all, all these life sentence risks went away for a deal we could live with. Good, good. All right. and, and so that uh, on its face, it's just another possession of a controlled substance in the state of Texas. But on the back end, these small battles, you know, putting on the gloves, stepping into the ring, excluding the, the state's key piece of evidence, the contraband in question, and getting the jury to hear why did we have this extremely elaborate search and yet this jacket is searched at some point later, not on camera, right? The CSI, right? The, the jurors expect almost, I do agree, they almost expect OJ Simpson level police forensics on every single case taken to trial and the counties don't have those resources, but to see that in effect swing a jury that I thought, Oh boy, we're going to get hung. Yeah. Right. yeah. I don't call them hanging juries for nothing. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That certainly makes things interesting for sure. For sure. So, Hey, we're, we're, we're kind of getting, short yeah, on. we're, we're getting on our time. So we know what's the most important thing you could teach an attorney just starting in criminal law. I would say that the best thing you can do is learn to be a master of your, of your craft, find a mentor, build an alliance, get around people that are smarter than you and that are willing to invest their time their talent and even their treasure into you, but also don't be, if you are at the beginning of your career, so never stop learning, right? You know, Marty and I take a lot of time to invest in additional learning. We're learning all the time. In fact, whether that be through additional continuing legal education courses or other professional development course. It doesn't really matter. Never stop learning those. That's the biggest takeaway I could give to a young attorney. Yep. Absolutely. Any, any certain level of crime they should start with probably shouldn't go in on a, on a murder one. Case. <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> I would not, but yeah, I would not recommend taking a capital murder or, or first degree felony at this point and, and you know for a new attorney and i will tell you that even now when i get hired on first degree felony cases or or any felony cases you know and even some misdemeanors that you've really got to be thoughtful about your skill level and if you do get hired on one of those you really need to invest no matter what it takes in the most state of the art continuing education you can find. So you can be ready. Or, or partner with somebody that could coach it. Right? Exactly. Exactly. If you can, you know, but I, I mean, it's safe to start with misdemeanors, maybe even some state jail felonies because much of the casework is negotiation. Most cases resolved 99% resolved by plea bargain. Less yeah. than 4% are go to trial. That's a fantastic tip right there. Most cases don't go to trial. They're negotiating, yeah. they're plead out. There's a, it's, it's kind of like a mediation without a mediator. It's just uh, yeah, dealing with that's the, exactly. or the, 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 whatever the attorney is that's handling the uh, state side or state or federal side. It's really just dealing with them and, and negotiating. So negotiating skills is really what I would say really hone your skills at. Completely agree. Completely agree. 
sales and negotiations. Yeah, ne negotiating and know the law. And then, you know, some some saved rounds on that, know the law. One of the hardest cases I ever tried, my only not guilty. And and we we, you know, in retrospect, the state the state probably knew all along it was going to be a not guilty, but it was a first first offense DWI with a very, very questionable blood, excuse me, breath analysis. Yeah. Right. And, and the only reason it was defensible is there, there was a breath analysis that was in the zone of question as to whether the client was or was not intoxicated that it was that low, right? Yeah, it was right. that low. And I would say that 95% or more, maybe 99.9%. .9%, I don't know if I'll ever have a, a DWI case again, that that was so difficult. And it literally, I put more work into that scientifically educating myself with expert witnesses than I did in any criminal case ever. Right. So Be no law, that's the tip. Yeah. And it, I mean, but this was a misdemeanor, yeah. right? right? And, and other warnings, right? A class C misdemeanor assault against a family member, husband and a wife pushing mad at each other. And it results in a class C that's a ticket only offense mm -hmm. carries the same gravity because of the family violence finding as a, as a state jail felony family violence, because it takes away your second amendment, right? Yep. Right. Takes away your right to adopt a child, even though it's a class C misdemeanor with a family violence finding no more second amendment for you. So it know the law. That's super critical. Okay. Awesome. And how can they contact you for more tips on practicing criminal law? Well, the email is Casey at Ashmore law firm.com Casey at Ashmore law firm.com or chat. At, at, That's the letter K the letter C not KC. Correct. Letter K letter C at Ashmore law firm.com or info I N F O info at Ashmore law firm.com. All right. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. All right. I'm going to end this broadcast and we'll see what we got.